Good morning, everyone. Chronic fatigue. What is the root cause of chronic fatigue and how can you start the healing process is the topic we are going to talk about today with Dr. Diane Muller. Dr. Diane is a naturopathic doctor and doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine. She is the author of Stress Resi Resilience and co-owns an online functional medicine certification school. I am Amita from Nourish Doc a platform for natural and holistic therapies. I'd like to introduce all of you to Dr. Diane. Welcome, Dr. Diane. Thank you, Amita. It's so wonderful to be here. Hello, everybody. Okay, so let's um, start with uh, understanding the root cause of uh, chronic fatigue. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting to talk about the root cause of a variety of things. And today, obviously, we're talking about chronic fatigue. Because one of the things that's so different in, you know, what I do and what you guys do at Nourish Docs is really in regards to where we start, say, our diagnoses and treatment. And mm -hmm. one of the things we see in conventional medicine is that when people get a diagnosis like chronic fatigue syndrome, for example, oftentimes that's just the end. You know, oftentimes it's like, this is the diagnosis, here's the medication, and then yeah. it's almost like we're done, right? Yeah. And, and one of the things I, I so love about your guys' work, about what we're doing, is really in regards to the fact that a diagnosis like chronic fatigue is, is actually not really the end. In a lot of ways, it's the beginning. And so all of the things we see here on the screen are some of the top key things of chronic fatigue. And a lot of people are familiar with adrenal problems and thyroid problems, nutrient imbalances some people are thinking of. One of the key things in nutrient imbalances that I see people missing is something called antiparietal cell antibodies. And mm -hmm. so antiparietal cell antibodies are basically where our body is starts attacking the parietal cells and the parietal cells make something called intrinsic factor that allows us to absorb B12. And what's super interesting about that is just taking B12 orally or even sublingually does not seem to fix those B12 levels. So if we have something like antiparietal cell antibody syndrome, where our body is really attacking those parietal cells, we can take all the B12 we want and we're not going to absorb it. So that's a really important one that I see people miss. I wanted to make sure to touch on that. Chronic kidney infections are things like Lyme disease. Bartonella is um, cat scratch fever. And this actually affects about 90% of cats actually carry this particular microorganism. So it's so high. And it's not something that's on a lot of people's radar and it can lead to a lot of fatigue. And then the male and female hormone imbalances, that's things, of course, like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. This one, one of the important things to, to think about here is a lot of people are aware of the importance of these hormones and that we need to have proper estrogen progesterone balance and our testosterone levels need to be high. And certainly there's, you know, sometimes reason to do things like bioidenticals, but oftentimes we don't even need to go there for a large portion of the population. If again, we're asking the question, why? Like, why do people have these hormone imbalances? And for a lot of these types of things with the sex hormones, a lot of times it's endocrine disruptors, it's plastics, it's toxins in the environment, it's mycotoxins from mold, it's heavy metals, all of these types of things getting into our body through our food, through our breath will really cause these imbalances. And a lot of times when we ask why and we start to discover these underlying hidden reasons and test for them, we can actually fix things like these hormone imbalances and the fatigue that's a sequelae of them just by going to that route. That, so, that's yeah, no, no, I, I was just going to add that I myself have gone through chronic fatigue a few years back and, and I couldn't figure out why I'm getting tired all the time. And it's interesting to see all these reasons. And I went to the doctor so many times and they couldn't, I mean, nobody could figure out what was wrong with me and I look perfectly normal. And, and I don't know how I overcome that, but, but it's interesting that you bring all these different issues that, that could be the root cause of chronic fatigue, which a lot of people are not aware of that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad you bring this up. It's such a good point because 
I think it's a really frustrating thing to society at large, right? That we go to the doctor and we see that these standard labs are run and mm -hmm. everything is normal. And I'm glad you brought this up because I think another key point to hit on, for example, is how when we evaluate labs to determine, for example, if we have like a thyroid disorder, what the lab reference ranges are. And when we're coming up with the lab reference ranges, by the reference ranges, I just mean like what the normal is um, to yeah. those of you who don't know that term. So how we determine those reference ranges are actually based upon sick people, not based yeah. upon healthy people. And yeah. so the reference ranges when we look at healthy people for thyroid disorder, like where it's like a sick, per sick person, the reference range is here. We're actually looking at what health looks like. The reference range is much more narrow. And so it's very common with cases like, you know, you're you know, talking about with your own health where people are often told that they're fine when we're actually based upon, we're basing their diagnoses upon sickness instead of upon wellness. Yeah. So, um, okay. Any, any other thoughts or you want me to continue no. on with the rest of these? Yeah, please, please continue. I just wanted to mention that because I, I, I've had this issue myself a few, quite a few years back, so. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Well, you know, also on the slide, you know, blood sugar is a big thing. And you know what's so interesting about blood sugar? Because we talk a lot about balancing blood sugar and we don't want it too high, we don't want it too low. But what's interesting is sleep actually will cause us for about 24 hours to be insulin resistant. So if we get anything less than six hours of sleep on any one given night, the next day we become insulin resistant just temporarily and we have a high level of glucose in our blood for that day. And for, you know, a temporary time period, we actually have, you know, we could have like borderline diabetes just for a single point in time. Now it will reset as soon as we sleep another, you know, another night that's more than six hours. But the problem is for people that chronically are not getting enough sleep is that this happens day after day after day after day. And then we can get, you know, blood sugar imbalances and those blood sugar imbalances over time when we're not getting sugar inside of our cells, it's, you know, and healthy sugars too, this isn't necessarily bad sugar, our healthy carbohydrates, you know, these types of things, when they're not getting into our cells, that alone is going to give us chronic fatigue. So that's a big one. Mold illness will actually cause chronic fatigue by dysregulating our hormones is a big thing that mold illness does. So mold illness is when we have a genetic anomaly where we, our immune system, because of this anomaly, is actually not able to recognize the toxins for mold. So it's very different than an allergy. It's like we, it's a toxic buildup due to our genes not being able to actually recognize the mold, and that can cause fatigue. Cardiac problems, so cardiac problems like blood pressure problems, where we are, say, have a low blood pressure or high blood pressure, we're not able to properly get nutrients to our cells. We see chronic fatigue with that. Obviously, things that are more severe cardiac-wise, we go into like heart failure, you know, those types of situations have severe fatigue with them, but even minor cardiac problems can cause it. So I mentioned toxins and then stress and some of this mental, emotional, physical trauma all kind of get tied into one thing. What's so exciting to me about current research on stress is that it really is looking at, well, let me take a step back and explain a particular study. So a lot of the studies on stress on, uh, for humans, a lot of the human studies will actually create stress by having people uh, get on stage in front of an audience and do mental, mental arithmetic on stage because that's a, something that creates a lot of stress for us humans. And so there's studies where it's like an entire group of people will get up one by one, do this mental arithmetic on stage, but then they'll be, you know, the researcher will be chatting with them about their internal dialogue about this stressful event. And so some people will say like, yeah, this feels stressful to me, but this is really kind of a cool opportunity. Like I'm scared of stages. I have an opportunity to improve this. They're kind of like that have, they have that positive spin. Other people are more like, you know, a little bit thinking about this from like a negative standpoint. And what we see in research, and there's multiple studies like this, is that people that actually have a positive spin on it have a normal cortisol stress hormone response. The people that have a negative spin have a pathological stress hormone response, and that pathological stress hormone response leads to chronic fatigue. 
So it's very, very interesting then when we talk about stress, yes, there's things we can do externally. We can you know, focus on good relationships and jobs that fulfill us and these types of things, but there's only so much of our external environment that we can control. And when we can learn to control our internal state and our internal dialogue, that really changes a lot about how our body responds to stress. So this particular slide here is really just looking at kind of a summary of what I just described, kind of looking at, okay, if we're looking at the adrenals and the hormones and the cardiac system and fatigue or in, um, um, toxins and you know, these types of things, how do we organize it system by system? And so whether we're talking about chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or whatever our topic is, these are some of the main ways that we tend to look at finding the root cause is from a body you know, issue here on the left, we're really looking at tests that are gonna identify nutrient balance, imbalances, tests that are gonna identify toxic burden, tests that are gonna you know, identify hormonal balance and all the way through this wheel. The one thing to make sure everybody in, in the audience here is aware of is the term epigenetics. And so epigenetics is really the study of what's going to allow our genes to express. So we can have a gene for having some sort of disease process, but epigenetics is to say, okay, well, what's going to actually cause that gene to turn on and create disease? So that's also something that you know, we have to consider in these body root causes. And from a mind root cause perspective, it's really goes back to what I was saying regarding how the mind works in processing our day-to-day -day life, our internal dialogue. So if we have old traumas and all of us have old traumas and some of the traumas are very, very severe. You know, there's people that have gone through, through things that no human should have to go through. And some of the traumas are just simple things from childhood that our parents said, our teachers said that were traumas because we were too young to interpret the meaning of it. And we interpret it in a way that was not meant. And we're holding on to that meaning as, as something in life. And, and that's a trauma. It's not a trauma that's abnormal. It's just a normal part of the growth process. It doesn't mean anything about our parents or our teachers. It just means that's part of how we grow up. But when we can actually find what some of those beliefs are that were instilled in us, through our childhood experience, or we can work through the traumas of some of these more tragic and terrible events, we can actually change our relationship to stress, change our cortisol levels, change the way our nervous system responds on a day-to-day -day basis, which is all related to chronic fatigue. That's, that's very interesting on the mind part of it, that I think all of us have you know, experience something or the other. One of the things that, that you mentioned here, all of us have experienced one thing or the other at some point in our life, you know, fear, isolation, lack of purpose. It happens to all of us different time, you know, different time of our lives. So, so that can cause um, chronic fatigue is, is very interesting how you correlated that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important because I think we don't talk enough about these topics yet in, in medicine, in, in even just our interpersonal relationships, I think in society, because some of these topics I think are a little bit taboo, but you're hundred percent right. I totally agree with you. We all experience these things. And the more we can openly talk about these things as human experiences and share the ways that we can actually process these things in a way that is health promoting instead of disease promoting it's it's just so 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 important yeah well let's move on to how do we figure out if someone has a chronic fatigue syndrome or, you know what are the different tests that you recommend and yeah absolutely so these are some of the favorite our favorite companies that we use here um, so these are we're looking at how we test for some of the root causes we talked about and one of the things to mention is that from a root cause perspective, there's not one lab company, unfortunately, that has done like the research and development to make every test that they offer the best. So when it comes to various types of infections or various types of toxins or various other cardiometabolic markers, we really need to be choosy about which lab we do because I was just looking at a study this week on H. pylori, for example, and depending upon, so H. pylori 
for those of you guys listening that don't know, it's a, it's a bacterial infection that's, that colonizes the, the stomach. And mm-hmm. the test, depending upon what test we use, can range from a 46% chance of accuracy, depending upon the lab or the research, there's a little wiggle room in there, but about 46% chance of accuracy to a 96% chance, depending upon the testing mechanism. So, and not every lab company offers the testing mechanism that's going to get us that 96% accuracy. So that's why using a variety of lab companies um, are just so, so, so important. So like here we have Klongen, which um, does mycoplasma, which is um, is an infection from that. We talked about chronic hidden infections. I didn't mention mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is walking pneumonia, essentially. Klongen does a really good job of testing for that. Dunwoody, I just got a letter from them yesterday saying they're changing their they're in the process of changing their um, name, but they're still Dunwoody for now. They do a test looking for things like food reactions. They also look for things like intestinal permeability. So they're going to look for some of those gut issues, histamine issues. Then we have Dutch, which does adrenals and hormones. Avexi is a cool company that you can basically, they, um, they partner with a lot of the other labs on here. So if you just want to go through like one company and get all of these labs, they're partnered with a lot of these other lab companies, which is really cool. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful company. Um, they are working on getting us a, um, a what do you call it? A, a partnership account where they will help waive their initial setup fee. If you, so if you contact me, I can get, you know, get that information to you if you want to have a, a wave on some of that partnership account. Sure. But some of these other companies are GI Map, which does stool culture, Genova, which does SIBO, the Nutra Eval here. Great, great, great task for looking for micronutrients. And then just some of these other companies looking for um, Lyme. Nagalase is a broad spectrum viral viral marker. So mm-hmm. all viruses make this enzyme called Nagalase we can test for. And then the only company that I actually um, am realizing now in this moment that is left off that I want to make sure I mention is Quicksilver Labs. They do a fabulous, like, the best, in my opinion, the best metal test that's on the market is through Quicksilver Labs. And we're testing for lead and mercury. Quicksilver is the company to use. So how many tests would you do if someone uh, comes to you for a chronic fatigue? Um, you know, if I say, hey, Dr. Nayan, I'm, I have a chronic fatigue, how many tests would you recommend that I do? This is quite yeah. overwhelming to look at so it many is. tests. It yeah. is. Yeah. Thanks for asking that because the test overwhelm is a real thing for sure. So for mm-hmm. most people, we'll start with three to four tests and we kind okay. of figure out what test to use. Like if somebody has a lot of pain, for example, and it's migrating and one day it's in the shoulder, another day it's in the hip, um, that's a big sign of Lyme disease. So then I'm gonna look more for, you know, tick-borne is gonna be on that panel. If somebody has, for example, um, sleep issues as a predominant thing, I might go more towards the adrenals. So it's really going to be looking at fatigue, but also looking at all of the other concomitant symptoms that come with it to then put the test in order and then how we practice and what we recommend to the docs we train is start with you know three or four tests that seem like they're gonna be your biggest hitters when you look at the whole picture. And we train people how to kind of analyze that because it's, you know, it's a little bit complicated, but we guide people through how to do that. Then we treat, you know, and if we're saying, okay, well, we after treating what came up on the test, say somebody is 50% better. Then we say, okay, well now we, you know, we only discovered a portion of the problem. So at this point, then we might decide to do another round. So we take it in steps. Got it, got it, got it. All right, so let's talk about the, let's say the test come back and then how does the healing process start? So the healing process is absolutely, uh, you know, like we have on the screen here, it's a mix of lifestyle. So looking at sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene is things like, what are we doing before bed? What are our lights looking like? We can use blue blocker glasses to basically block the red light that is so inhibitory to the production of melatonin that helps us sleep. So maximizing sleep, exercise, making sure people are exercising not too much, not too little. Too much, for example, is actually shown to turn down 
um, the function of the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the energy producing components of our cells. And research has shown that once we reach like the 60 minute mark of exercise, we actually turn down our mitochondria versus like less than that and we build more. So it can be a really important thing to make sure that people are in that sweet spot, which oftentimes is 15 to 45 minutes in you know, blocks of exercise. So talking to them about that food wise, we really believe that food is unique and that every body is unique, but some basics that just kind of are across the board for everybody are things like avoiding GMOs, getting organic as much as possible, doing grass fed, grass finished meats and dairy as much as possible. People tolerate dairy, getting industrial seed oils out like our sunflowers, our safflowers, our canolas, our peanut, those types of oils. So those are really good basics. And then some people we find you really good on paleo. Some people we find don't do well on paleo. They need some of those carbohydrates. So it's really been just kind of trial and error once we get some of those basic inflammatory things out. It's trying diets, seeing how people feel, having them report how they feel. They feel great on it. We keep it. If it feels like there could be improvement, then we alter it a little bit. And then herbs are really in the research-based supplements are really going to be dependent upon what comes back on the lab. So somebody comes up with a Bartonella, that cat scratch fever, we'll give herbs that treat that. If somebody comes up with an adrenal dysregulation, we'll give herbs that treat that. Okay. And then... Um... Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more, continue with the healing process itself. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, happy to. So everything I just described, we kind of in our practice put under like that functional medicine. Um, mm -hmm. It's you know, research-based things, treat upon the lab, make sure that we're doing that root cause. And then the other components that we really feel are important for healing are working on the mind. So it's really starting to, you know, tab and give exercises for people. And this is something for anybody listening that I would encourage you to do today is pay attention throughout the day. Just have like your phone and your notes app up or have like a little piece of paper. And anytime you notice a thought that's like not the highest thought, that's probably a little bit negative, write it down. And the first time I did this exercise, I was shocked and I had been already working on this stuff for a while. And I was like, yeah, a lot oh of negative <laughs> all of us do actually, you know, thinking, oh my God, what is this? What is that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I already thought I had a lot of awareness around this and I did. And even with that, I was still having plenty of thoughts that were, you know, were going through my head that were not helpful. So the first step is just creating awareness. And then once we have that awareness, step three with behavioral design is really looking at how do humans motivate themselves to actually change their behavior. And so the first thing is, is having that awareness, is having that motivation to move towards a better life, to avoid a more painful life, these types of things. But then it's making sure that the change is built into our life in a way that we're really able to do it. So if we're working on our thoughts, like in this example, an easy thing to do is to say, okay, well, what am I doing all day long? What is something that I, I'm going to do all day long that's actually going to serve as like a prompt, a cue, a reminder to um, help me remember to, to make this change? So doorways are a good example. We walk through bathroom doors. We walk through bedroom doors. We walk through car doors. All day long, we walk through doors. So an easy prompt is to say, okay, well, every time I walk through a door, I'm going to think the thought that I want to start programming my neurology, my neurological system to think instead of that thought that's not serving us. And then that type of method of looking for the motivation, incorporating into daily life, and then looking for that cue to remember, we can use that same behavioral design, not only for thoughts, but for how do we change our sleep hygiene? How do we make sure we remember to take our supplements? You know, so it's a looking at the psychology of how humans successfully achieve change in their lives. That's, that's a fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating what you talked about, the negative thoughts. And, and there's no easy way. Like, you know, all the, like, how do you keep programming your mind? And you can program your mind to, to think of the positive. And, and so maybe you picture something that, that was a positive thought or positive moment in your life. I mean, that's kind of how you also teach that to, to your clients when they walk in. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, wow. That's, yeah. That's... Go ahead. 
No, 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 no. I, I, I'm just saying that this fascinating, along with the other problems that we are talking about, you know, some could have a physical, but the thought process, we never pay attention to our thought process so much is, is what I was going to comment on. Yes, I agree. And we really feel at, at our clinic that it's a, the thought process is a missing link. It's a missing yeah. link to, you know, to doing holistic care medicine because with seeing the research of like, oh, we think a thought that's negative. If I wake up and I think like, wow, my health just sinks and I'm never going to be well. Instantly, my cortisol is up. Instantly, my healing response is down. My immune system's turned down. So it's just becoming more and more clear in research that we can't ignore the power of the mind. All right, with that, I think we are um, at the end of this conversation. Well, would you like to add more before we end this session? I, the only thing I'd like, love to add is just kind of in conclusion that I really feel like the best way we can heal chronic fatigue, we can heal chronic illness in general, is really not segregating anything in our life. The brain is connected to the body. All of the organs are working together. So when we're yeah. working with chronic fatigue, we need to look at all of the organs, all of the glands, the health of the entire body, but making sure we're including the health of the brain and the thought processes and not segregating those as well. So yeah, so no, that, that's, that's very true. So someone walks in with a chronic fatigue and let's say you figure out all the labs that are wrong and then you give them supplements, food, but they have to continue. That, that's what I'm assuming. I'm asking the question. They have to continue that whole process for quite a few months or for all the time. I mean, that, that's what, right? That's what I'm understanding from you. That like, yeah. it's not like a two month or a one month pill that you give it to them and say, oh, take this, take this and you're gonna be fine. It's not like, uh, it's, it's a continuous process that they have to do to keep, make sure that they don't get the chronic fatigue again, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the healing part for most people is a six to 12 month process. Usually okay. we see, see close to a dozen different root causes come up for, for the average client. So it's a lot to work through and that can wow. feel overwhelming, but in, you know, the stuff we find at the root of this 99.9% .9 of the time it's reversible. So it's actually empowering. Um, it can be overwhelming, but when we take it step by step, it really takes care of the overwhelm. Once people are well, then what we tend to rec you know, recommend is some of the key, you know, major lab things, their types of uniqueness that showed up on their lab profiles, then we check in on them at least every 12 months. And most of the time, once people are well, we find that, oh, you know, two or three supplements that are specific to keeping them well is really all the average person needs. So it, it gets really fairly easy once to maintain once we're well. Sure. So uh, in your experience, uh, we, talk, you, we talked about the root causes that may cause chronic fatigue. What is the most common one or two that you have seen? It, it, just according to your practice, in your practice, I would say that. In my practice, I would say from a mind, you know, mind situation, just that chronic vicious cycle where we're ruminating and we can't stop our mind because that's yeah. so related to the cortisol levels as well to sleep and other things. So definitely the mind. And the other thing that I've seen is probably one of the, I'd say number two are chronic hidden infections, whether it's a bacterial hidden infection, a parasite, a virus, fungus, some sort of hidden infection um, that nobody has caught is extreme. Almost everybody has some sort of hidden infection. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Um, you know, this is a very, I think, informative session for all of us. All of, uh, you know, all of us have gone through chronic fatigue at some point. Let us know on, on, to all the viewers who are listening in. Uh, we didn't announce this uh, event ahead of time, but the next event we'll have at Dr. Diane is in November, so we'll announce it ahead of time. But let us know about your feedback and we have our emails we have our websites uh, please let us know about our sessions and our feedback with that i'd like to wrap up anything else from you dr diane before i wrap no, up? no thank you amita and thank you to your community it's really been a pleasure being here thank you so much for being with us bye-bye my pleasure take care <laughs>